It's Congress of Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in sublime, uh, pristine, uh, pokertudinous Ann Arbor, Michigan. Comics.aadl.org, and this is the show where we talk about making comics, uh, publishing comics, the business of making comics, the lifestyle of the per the people who participate in this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Joe's cartoonist and teaching artist, and with me today, we got an in-studio guest again. Thank goodness, we got Lore. Lore, ooh. Hi, guys, and ooh. thanks for getting that right. Did I get it right? <laughs> yes. Okay. I heard you pronounce it at ALA, and I was like, have I been saying it wrong all this time? I, I wasn't <laughs> sure if I was, but Lore Ui of Poltergeist, lorebits.com. Mm-hmm. And uh, freshly back from ALA. Yeah. Oh, man, that was an amazing con. <laughs> Spike, have you been to ALA? Let's do Spike Trotman. She's here, too. I don't even know what ALA is. Okay, we should talk about this at the top real quick, because you should. did a report, Laura, on your website. Was it at Lorebits, or was it on a yeah, different blog? Yeah, it's on uh, lorebits.com. And uh, I've just basically talked about the American Library Association uh, conference in Chicago. And it was just amazing, because uh, most of the people that attended were librarians or friends or of librarians and they were just so supportive of Poltergeist. You know, the, they had a, a little artist alley there, which I think was in the, its second year. Second um, or third. Second or third year. And um, yeah, it was just such and a big conference. So yeah, it's the American Library Association Conference mm -hmm. and it's a yearly event. It's in Las Vegas next year and they have an artist alley for cartoonists now. And the, the fee for the table is you donate a couple books and a piece of original art to be auctioned. That's the fee. That's to be it. Oh. That's it. And and the climate. Now we talked about this on the Kids Comics Revolution podcast. I talked about it in the Lean Into Art cast. But the the climate there is so unique because in the library world, who's more uh, associated with traditional book publishing, mm -hmm. you have, you know, uh, Jane Ivanovich books. Her name is huge at the top. Titles underneath, right? Right. And the librarians treat you that way. You're the author. <laughs> You're the star, right? You're an author? You're oh, a rock star. Yeah. <laughs> that is and, and so I was talking with some other artists who were there who only do ALA, and they're like, should I go to traditional Comic Cons? And, and they listed off a couple, which I won't name here. And they said, should I go to this one? Should I go to that one? I'm like, well, do you like to be uh, <laughs> sit at a table for eight hours and have people walk by and sneer at you? Or do you like this, where you sit around <laughs> and librarians come up and they treat you like a hero? So, Spike, you need to do ALA. Uh, Clearly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Definitely recommend that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an amazing show. And and it's uh, the artist alley is small, but it's growing. And it's all really great cartoonists there. It's a uh, tremendously good time. But And I have some books I would absolutely love to get in libraries. So. <laughs> exactly. Right. So... Uh, but yeah, yeah, you can go to lorebits.com, everybody, to read her report to see what uh, she thought of ALA. Uh, but then we got to turn to, yes, return to the show. We got the whole uh, cast back together. Last time we had you guys together was episode 72 at comicsagreat.com slash CAG72. Yep. Um, Spike Trotman, templaraz.com. Hello. And uh, iron, uh, iron underscore Spike on the Twitters. Your lorebits on the Twitters, mm -hmm. Lore. Um, and we're going to talk about Kickstarter. And I want to. <laughs> My favorite thing ever. And it, I've got the reason I asked you guys both back is because you're both success stories. You've both successfully done a thing on Kickstarter. I'm holding in my hand a book that this was this is a Kickstarter produced book right mm -hmm. here, right? So this is physical. This is a real thing. Spike has books up on the screen. Uh, Don't I? Though. Awesome books. <laughs> So let's go through. Let's go th just to establish your credibility really fast, and we'll get to okay. asking questions about Kickstarter and successfully funding Kickstarter. So, poor craft. All no right. Problem. Okay. At the end of 2009, I successfully funded Poor Craft on Kickstarter for $13,000 after asking for $6,000. Back when $13,000 on Kickstarter was a big deal. Big deal. Um, 220 it was two years in the making. It uh, began production in 2010. It was finally published in 2012 to great critical acclaim by the likes of a V Club and such. Uh, it was award winning. It won a Comic Arts Award at the 2013 Stumptown Awards. And it is a great book I am very proud of. I'm hoping it'll replace Oh, the Places You'll Go as the standard graduation <laughs> present. And you're working on book two right now with Ryan Estrada of Ryan Estrada. Yeah, Ryan Estrada, the artist for Porecraft, Diana Knock, will be making a reappearance. We are 50 pages in on the sequel, which was is going to, in all likelihood, be called Porecraft, colon, Wish She Were Here. And it's about travel. And if you know anything about Ryan, 
you couldn't think of a better person to write a book on how to travel on the cheap. Yeah, that is absolutely yeah. true. And then then we've got so that was two hundred and twenty six percent funded. Then we yes. got Smut Peddler. Hello. Four hundred and fifteen percent funded. This is probably my biggest. This is definitely my biggest Kickstarter to date. What I happen to have here is a hardcover copy, which are still going out. Smut Peddler is a resurrection of a digest-sized mini comic that happened appropriately enough in the early noughties. It was published by Saucy Goose Press. There were three of them, and they were just sort of best and the brightest of the alt and the indie publishing world, doing saucy little porno stories. And um, it was not published again for a while. It went on a very long hiatus. And then I eventually, I imagine the editors got tired of me harassing them. And they said, if you want it resurrected so bad, you do it. So I did. Uh, and it finished out at the time at ninth most, at, as the ninth most success, successful um, comic Kickstarter on Kickstarter at the time. So it was uh, $83,000 and change, I think. And uh, it's been a great success. Uh, people love it. It is also critically acclaimed, also award-winning. Beat out Fantagraphics and Dark Horse for Best Anthology at the Comic Arts Awards in Stumptown. And I'm very proud of it. And there is for sure going to be a sequel. <laughs> it has also inspired me to uh, make that sort of story more available because there is a big... Uh, there's a big audience in comics, in my opinion, that is simply not being catered to, which is women who want to read erotic graphic novels. And if I have my way, I will have some for them very soon. <laughs> and then we get to Sleep of Reason. Yes. Yeah. I which... do not have that book because it is currently still in production. That was kickstarted for $47,000 and change, I think, or 46, almost 46, 47,000. 46, 34% yes. funded. Yes, and originally I asked for twenty thousand. Uh, it is a my attempt to resurrect the indie horror anthology, and uh, it it went well. <laughs> and that is my third Kickstarter, my third Kickstarter success. And in case you couldn't tell, I am a big proponent of Kickstarter. I am what you could safely refer to as an early adopter of Kickstarter. Back in the day when people said Kickstarter was begging and panhandling and oh I would I would never use Kickstarter and why would anyone use Kickstarter and you know three years later those same people are hey check out my Kickstarter <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then we get to Lars Kickstarter Poltergeist Volume 1 which I showed on the screen here fantastic mm -hmm. book uh, you right. asked for 3000 you got $4,610 mm -hmm. right so there's another success story you got more than you asked for uh so I'll start because I know your time is limited. You only got like 10 minutes before you got to go because we got a late start today. I'm so sorry. No, it's, it's yeah. you know, it, it's the technological uh, pr problems of putting on a live show and recording it with all these special effects and multiple cameras that we got a late right. start. But um, what's the number one thing you learned from doing Kickstarter? Like if you were to do another one tomorrow, which you may, mm -hmm. right? Pay attention to lorebits.com for, <laughs> for <laughs> volume two coming soon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what's, what's the one thing you would do differently? After doing the first one? Um, I'd say definitely, well, uh, the one thing I would do again would be oh, okay. preparation. Uh -huh. And um, that's always the biggest thing whenever I uh, take on a new challenge is like, uh, how much knowledge can I possibly absorb before I actually start? Because most people um, think that Kickstarter is the 30-day period and that's it, when really <laughs> there's so much that goes beyond <laughs> that. Um, uh, I recommend reading up on... Uh, you know, resources like oh, building a platform right before that, you know, at least six months leading up to the Kickstarter campaign. Um, you know, I have like a blog post where I collected all these resources, you know, like how to have a successful Kickstarter blog posts. Because, you know, I was really like, I want to do this right. And I want to do this, you know, I don't, I don't want to waste anybody's time. I don't want, I, I wanted to do this. Um, to the best of my abilities. And so I treated it like a homework project, basically. Okay, I want to know as much as I can about this and um, and then execute. So um, it, uh, as a way of um, uh, redoing those steps, basically publish my comic as a webcomic, uh, you know, before the Kickstarter uh, campaign starts um, as a way of leading up to that, like, event. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I'd be doing again. And um, yeah, I mean, 
uh, as far as lessons, maybe uh, asking people that I know more about, like, oh, um, plugging it. Because before, you know, I didn't really have an ongoing webcomic, so I, d I didn't actually have that platform in place. Well, that's the thing I was going to ask you. Is like I, was, I just checked your Twitter feed just to see. Like, mm -hmm. you don't have, like, tens of thousands of followers on Twitter, no, right? No, no, so I'm didn't very have... modest. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, not, that's not a criticism. I, I actually, I think that's really impressive is that, you know, you, you don't have what somebody would call a famous person's platform, yet you managed to find on your thing, mm -hmm. and I'm guessing it wasn't just mom and dad. <laughs> no, no. I'm very, <laughs> so, very surprised at that too. I'm like, oh my god, all these people! I don't know where they're coming well, from. <laughs> there's, there's that, there's that thousand true fans idea at yeah, least, yeah. partially at work there. But uh, something that, and, and I, I'll save this for after you have to go. But I wanted to go through Spike's, uh, you know, Spike's Kickstarter advice, which you posted a couple years ago on Google Plus. But one of the things you put in there that I'm wondering if you could respond to, Laura mm -hmm. and Spike, is. Yeah. Uh, Okay, if you don't have, uh, this is number four. If you don't have a pre-existing fan base, Kickstarter will probably not work for you if you're asking for thousands of dollars. Sorry, that's just kind of how it is. This isn't concrete. A promo from someone with a huge pre-existing fan base could work just as well. But you get my meaning, right? So in mm -hmm. other words, like getting somebody to blurb your project, is that what you're talking about there, Spike? That's what I'm talking about. And, you know, I feel like I want to sort of like add an appendix to that. Um, I think a lot of people, when they look at Kickstarter, the thing that kind of blinds them are like the literal half million dollar Kickstarters, the two hundred thousand dollar Kickstarters, the the six figure Kickstarters in general. It's like you don't need that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't need that, and you shouldn't be looking at that in terms of like the fact that somebody can make two hundred thousand dollars on Kickstarter shouldn't make you go, oh well, gosh, it's not for me. If you are a person who is fresh out of art school has no online presence, has no professional ties or connections, and you put up a Kickstarter, if you put it up for about $500 so you can publish a mini and take it to a show, you might make it. You know, I'm, I'm not saying you won't. But you cannot show up out of the clear blue sky and propose your magnum opus at the age of, like, 19, you know, and request for $50,000 to live on while you finish it. Like, you have no street cred to put it in, you know, term, ba really basic terms. No one knows what your work is like. No one knows if you're a person who follows through on their word, and no one knows if you're even any good, mm -hmm. you know? So why should they take a risk and give you a few bucks? There will always be a few people who are all like, sure, what the heck here, and they'll give you, you know, $15, but that will not get you to 50. People going, sure, what the heck, will not get you the really, really, really big numbers. The people you see with the huge numbers are the people who have put in the work and do have the street cred. So going back to this idea of getting somebody to blurb for you, Laura, what yeah. would you do? What would be your rules of engagement? Like, how would you approach going to somebody who has a platform to say, hey, would you mind doing a video for me to, like, endorse my Kickstarter? Well, uh, first I would have to actually have something to present to them, you know? <laughs> like, I would, I would go, before asking them to blurb something, I would have to have at least if I were going to be doing this, um, a webcomic that's already, you know, serializing and almost done, because that's kind of the best proof that, hey, I can do this. Yeah. Um, and then they could actually look through it, see if that's their thing, and then um, they'd be happy to, to plug it in, to plug it for you, because really, um, it doesn't take that much time. Well, and, you well know, would, you, and would you contact somebody you don't have a personal relationship, though, is what I'm asking. Um, you know, that yeah, that's definitely something right? that because, I would, yeah. Because no, this is something that happens to us, right? Sensitive Spike, point, back me up. Yeah. yeah, back me up on this, Spike. Like, when, when you start having a presence, I'm sure it's happened to you too, Laura. Like, you get people who will say, like, hey, could you retweet my Kickstarter? Hey, could you, uh, like, and, uh, in particular, I get people who say, like, uh, hey, Jersey, never spoken to you before in my life, but can I be on your show? You know, and then that's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. But it just, it, it speaks to this idea that, you know, I'm I'm more likely to respond warmly to somebody who I have a personal relationship with, or yeah. at least have a friendly exactly. relationship right, with, right? right? Yeah, yeah. If you have pals, it couldn't hurt to sort of let your pals know something's up that mm -hmm. you've got a Kickstarter going, and you'd really appreciate a retweet or something. Right, right. I'm not going to say it's always a hundred percent inappropriate to bother a stranger, but if you are going to bother a stranger. It should be a straight line from point A to point B. No mystery why you're bothering that stranger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you should not go to the you know Twitter front page, find the people with the top 25 most followers, and spam them, will you please retweet this and promote my Kickstarter? For example, I got a retweet from Clive Barker for The Sleep of Reason. Pretty because cool. 
Clive Barker is a horror guy, so it kind of makes sense. And I was all like, hey, check out my Kickstarter and tell me what you think. And he retweeted me, and cool, I got a retweet from Clive Barker. But that kind of makes sense, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, if he's a horror guy, it's a horror Kickstarter, there you go. Uh, I know he likes comics, you know, maybe he'll be into this comic. It's, you know, not exactly rocket surgery. But, you know, for example, I wouldn't be bothering, gosh, I don't know, uh, Justin Bieber. (laughs) (laughs) Right. To well, promote my Kickstarter. Well, you're getting yeah. at something where it's like there's a difference between saying, hey, can you help a fella out? Yeah. And mm. this may be something that would delight you. Mm. And if it does, yeah. it, if you could tell your constituency about it, that would be awesome. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Right. Because, uh, yeah, I'm just I'm just imagining somebody listening to this or watching this going like, oh, that's a great idea. I'm going to go t- get Will Wheaton to, to you know, reblog my thing about why uh, my, my graphic novel about why Star Trek sucks. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's worth noting, too, um, if you're thinking in terms of people like uh, Neil Gaiman or Will Wheaton or somebody like that, they probably get people asking for promos maybe 10, time. 15 times a day. Yeah. So, you know, don't be shocked if you somehow slip through the cracks there. And for the love of God, nobody owes you a plug. OK. Yeah. Please, there. Just like let, let's let's bring the attitude down a few levels. Because I know there are some people, not a lot of people, and no names, there are some people who are convinced they had a winning Kickstarter and they would have made it to goal if only Famous Guy 15, you know, had given them a plug or written a blog well, post or whatever. I want to I jump on that real quick. This is great because this is the final, because I, I know you got to go, Laura. Uh, oh, I wanna, oh. final, <laughs> final word. So you, you successfully met your Kickstarter, mm-hmm. funded it with $1,000 to spare. And I'm going to be the internet troll guy for a second go, lucky, you got lucky because like the right people, you know, the right people, you didn't do anything. Oh, nice. Oh right? my God. Um. <laughs> <laughs> what would be your response to that? Look, um, I was unemployed at the time, but it, <laughs> it was, it, I, I was basically working 14 hour days, like handling that Kickstarter, handling, um, working, uh, finishing the book as it, as, as I did that Kickstarter campaign, you know, ta- talking to people and trying to get people to actually notice it. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, y- you can feel that way or you can think that way, but at, in the end, it, you know, hard work wins all and, you know, that, Kickstarting, kickstarting is work. So yeah. What else can Running I say? Running a Kickstarter is like living on a high gravity planet for thirty days. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's it's not easy. It's you you not. just it's exhausting because if you're doing it properly, the whole time you're thinking, is there an angle I haven't worked? Is there a, a promotional you know path I haven't tried yet? I have to make sure that mm. I at the end of thirty days I don't sit there and go, oh man, I should have, I should have, I should have. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I bought, I mean, for Sleep of Reason, for example, um, I bought banner ads. I made multiple posts on Tumblr. I updated mm-hmm. the Kickstarter every maybe three to five days with excerpts of pages. Right, right. So at the, end of, at the end of the Kickstarter, there were like 20, maybe 30 pages of comics like in the updates to check out. Wow. And yeah. it's, I mean, all the, all the sort of bonuses, I, all the people who are participating in the Sleep of Reason, because it's an anthology, I ask them, you know, if there's anyone here who feels like contributing a bonus backer level, let me know. You know, it wasn't just buy the book, buy the PDF, you're done. Yeah. You know, there were tons and tons of bonus backer levels. And I, you know, did interviews and I sent emails, I sent press releases, I did everything I could to get this thing noticed. And you have to work twice as hard these days, because mm-hmm. Kickstarter... And comics are unusually well suited to each other. So every comic site is probably being bombarded with press releases <laughs> and requests for plugs from Kickstarter, from comic Kickstarters. And, you know, after a while, it all turns into white noise for them. Actually, so you have to be persistent and you have to believe in the project and you have to convince someone they have to care. Actually, you really have to conduct yourself like as a business when you're dealing with uh, a Kickstarter campaign. Essentially, yeah. like have a marketing plan in place, you know, where mm-hmm. are you going to uh, uh, talk about the, the project? You know, other right blogs, on. your own blog, your mm-hmm. Tumblr, your Twitter. Um, yeah, conduct yourself like a business. Mm-hmm. If you're not tweeting about your Kickstarter advice. every day, you're doing it wrong. 
Wow. I want to talk more about that, but I know you got to go because it's already five after one. <laughs> and I don't want to hold. I mean, unless do you have a minute or do you, you got you probably got to go. Uh, I can maybe do five more minutes. Five more <laughs> minutes. OK. OK. So. um, But yeah, like let's go into that, because if you're not tweeting about it every day, you're doing it wrong. Uh, pestering. You know, one of the things that I get from my fellow cartoonists and I've discussed with them is, ooh, Kickstarter, I don't want to have to tick off my friends for 30 days, right? Is this something that you guys worry about? or is it, and, and if No, because so, <laughs> I have to make my paper. I don't care. If you, don't, if you really cannot stand seeing one or two tweets from me every day for 30 days, that's about a Kickstarter, unsubscribe for 30 days because I'm not stopping. Yeah. Some of us have to make a living, okay? <laughs> the key there is being like one or two tweets, right? Not like one yeah. every hour for no, like 24 one, hours. What I do when I do a Kickstarter is I look for excuses like milestones like right, hey right, we're exactly. at 50 percent we're at 75 percent guys guys who wants to be the one donator who pushes us to 100 percent that automatically gets three or four that, yeah, right away that's it, yeah and then it's like oh we're almost at 200 percent we're almost at 250 like look for milestones mm -hmm. and that's what i talk about yeah and, and just conveying both your excitement and, and your yeah. passion for your project which is mm -hmm. you know like a very exactly. uh addictive and no one's going to care more about your project than you, you no one mm -hmm. so you have to be the cheerleader mm -hmm. you know yeah but but how do you guys i mean laura how would you compose what's the difference between like tweeting like hey bolder guys right it's a great book i love it and you'll love it too wink right what's the difference between doing that and going like guys i'm so excited about this book and i worked really hard on it i can't wait for this thing to come out right how do you compose how do you get that down 140 characters right it, it definitely is a personality thing too i mm. mean i convey a lot of gratitude in all my tweets so i'm like thank you so much guys this is amazing and this is wonderful and you know especially for like a first time uh book author and uh, an artist uh, there's um, gratitude is a huge thing. That's also, you know, definitely should be part of your marketing campaign as well. Um, you know, you're not entitled to getting a book. It, it, yeah. It's something that, uh, y you know, you're going to have to 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 convey to the, to the people that you you want to support. To, you want that will support you. So right. you know uh, that gratitude, humility, <laughs> a little yeah. bit of humility, at least, you know, for, for my type of personality to learn, like, I'm not, uh, <laughs> not, the <laughs> you, you, you're, you're not, you're not the most, uh, interesting man in the world from the beer commercial, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, I, I contributed to, uh, Chris Straub's Brood Hollow Kickstarter, mm -hmm. uh, which you just go to kickstarter.com and search for Chris Straub or Brood Hollow. Uh, it's a great project. I endorse it. Uh, and I, I contributed an amount and then he put out an update where it was a video of him being really like just full of gratitude. It's funded, but there's still like 21 days to go at the time of this recording. So mm -hmm. job done. He's got the thing funded and then some. So, but he still, he put out this video saying like, thanks so much guys. It means a lot to me that you guys actually believe in this thing. And you know what I did? I wound up upping my pledge because like I, it felt good to me to watch him feel good. I want to make him feel better. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, so like a little thing like that, like that gratitude mm -hmm. could go a long way. Right, Spike? Acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Acknowledgement. Yeah. yeah. When I when I put up uh, the the excerpts from the the story, since it's a horror story, you know you can't put the whole thing up. You just got to put up the setup. But um, when I posted them, sometimes people would comment in the updates of the you know the excerpt that I posted. It's like, okay, for future reference, this is the one that made me bump my pledge from fifteen to thirty dollars. Wow. You know, because yeah. it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. answering people's questions makes a difference. If people ask a question. First off, no one reads the fact. Just get over mm -hmm. it. No one reads the fact. <laughs> so if someone asks a question in um, the, the, the project comments, try to address it in an update because they may or may not go back to comments to check. You know, it's it, it, like, for example, um, people asked me if there was any way they could get a PDF format that would be non-comicsology. And enough mm -hmm. people asked that when I made an update, I was like, okay, we're going to probably put it out through Scribed, mm -hmm. which is how I put out the Smut Peddler PDF. So, you know, if you don't want to use comicsology, that'll be fine. And people were like, oh, great. And, you know, they, they pledged and they did this and they did that. They were, there was communication and they appreciated that. All right. Well, Laura, I'll give you uh, a final word before you have to go. Anything that you're up to that we, you know, use this opportunity to plug? Uh, um, no, I'm kind of, like, I'm sort of working on a secret project right now. Secret? And, uh, yeah. And, uh, Ooh. we'll see, we'll see if anything goes 
beloved by what what <laughs> oh no you can't even give us a hint you can't even say like wh- where should we watch for news about this secret thing um you know ba- basically check out my website if if anything goes <laughs> of it you know lorebits.com lorebits.com and lorebits i'm, on I'm on twitter. usually on twitter lorebits on are you twitter. on the tumblers too yes you uh-huh. posting um uh, pacific rim fan art <laughs> <laughs> I actually have an idea for a comic now. I'm like, oh my god, I have to make something for for this awesome movie. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Laura, for being a part of the show on such late notice and sticking around, even though we got a late start because you could have been all like, what? We're not starting at 12:30. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> but, 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 but no, you're a very gracious person for uh, taking the time to share some insights with us on Kickstarter. Thanks for inviting me again. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to have you back when we can actually have you for the full show. Yeah. But, all right, LauraBits.com, everybody. Thanks again, Laura. Bye, guys. Guys. Uh, bye, bye, Spike. Okay, so Spike, uh, let's go through some of these list items that you had in your Kickstarter advice column. That thing probably needs updating so bad, but let's do it. Well, this is an opportunity. This is a, make it a living document, right? Right on. Number one, make a video. Do it. Don't worry about looking un- unprofessional because unpolished, sincere videos are incredibly charming. Uh, and then you even point out how Joe Murray of Rock- Rocco's Modern Life just pointed a web- webcam at himself, right? Yep. I'm still a proponent proponent of the unpolished video. There are lots of like slick polished videos on Kickstarter now. It's clear some people are hiring professional cinematography crews to do these, but that's not necessary. Okay? It's not required. Don't look at someone's video that features a soundtrack and like, you know, like pans and wipes and all kinds of things and go like, Oh God, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can't do that. Well then do you have a webcam? Turn on your webcam, make sure that, you know, your apartment is reasonably clean and point it at yourself and make a video. (laughs) It's not, it's not a really high bar because even Kickstarter themselves say that videos make a project more likely to be funded. So um, I'm still behind that. Even if you have to go as low rent as low is, you know, if you have to just sit there and you have a bad mic, you have a bad webcam, as long as it doesn't actively hurt people to watch and listen to the video, make a video. So speaking of videos, mm-hmm. my, I got a question for you about when should you be in the video and when should you not be in the video. And I want, we've got the actual The Sleep of Reason video queued up. <laughs> And I'd like to play it. You won't be able to hear it, Spike. How long is the video, Matt? Is it about a minute? It's not long, yeah. Yeah, it's just a little over a minute. So I want to play the video so people can actually get a sense of what you've done. <laughs> and then we'll come back and we'll t- I'll follow up with my questions about it. So get ready whenever you are, Matt. We have something for you. We have First off, creepy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad you like it. Yeah, uh, I, can, I cannot take credit for that video. Um, that video, with obvious directorial input from myself, was made by my husband, Matt, in um, After Effects, if I'm not mistaken, and over the course of two or three days. And he is not by any means an After Effects pro. He has used it twice, once to make the video for Smut Peddler and once to make the video for The Sleep of Reason. Mm -hmm. Um, It's an Adobe product, so if you're familiar with Adobe and how they lay out their commands, you should be able to pick it up fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. I did not put myself in either The Smut Peddler or The Sleep of Reason video because they were anthology projects, so it felt Uh kind of... It would be weird, you know, if it was about me, because it's not really about me. It's about all of us. Yeah. So let's have stuff by all of us in it, you know. And 
while the smut peddler video was really sort of upbeat and really like, yay, porn. Woo! <laughs> uh, Sleep of Reason is very sort of opening of Tales from the Crypt on HBO. It's trying to freak you out with, you know, and he did all kinds. That's my husband's voice you hear on it. And he did all kinds of distortion to his voice. And, you know, uh, the, 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 all the, all the sounds you hear and all the visuals you hear with the, with the exception of the turning gear is um, stuff from free video sites and free sound sites. And so all that was put together just by some guy in some mm -hmm. room somewhere. So. Well, that's, that's good to point out too, that there are free resources. There's freeware mm -hmm. video editing software and there are uh, banks of free audio and yes, video clips. They're not can... hard to find either. Yeah. Uh, don't but... use stuff you don't have the rights for. That could get ugly. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Especially when you're asking for money. Uh, yeah. How long, how long should a video typically like for, just for your taste? You know, what, 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 how long is the point when you go, all right, I'm done. I'm not, you know, I'm I get the idea after two minutes. I say the only exception I have for the whole two minute thing is, uh, I have decided, of course, as someone who doesn't make video games, I have strong opinions on how they should be marketed on Kickstarter, <laughs> but, um, I have decided the ideal video game Kickstarter starts out with gameplay. The most polished gameplay you have, if it's not a finished game, if you're still like pre-alpha, you know, just some nice shots of the environments you've finished and the, you know, the character models you've finished and some basic gameplay and the baddies attack the goodies and there's a little fight and then, you know, you build the settlement and you impress me and then I want to see you. Not before. You know? <laughs> <laughs> because it's in those first few minutes where I'm watching the gameplay, I decide if I'm interested. I don't care what you have to say if those first few minutes aren't there. Mm -hmm. In comic Kickstarters, which are very much more of sort of a, a one-man band. Um, just show me your art. Tell me what you want to do. That's it. Just mm. I don't need seven minutes. I don't need five minutes. I don't need three minutes. Two minutes is plenty. Okay. So, so no, no slow turnaround where I got my back to the camera and then go, Hi. I'm Jersey yeah. Droz, and here's why you should care about me before I, I even show you any artwork, right? And I'm, I'm not a big fan of the fake, oh, hello there. <laughs> it's like, you made the video. I know you know it's on. <laughs> not even if it does like a, a freeze frame with my name underneath it, like the, like the credit rolls on like an 80s TV sitcom. No? Yeah, I've All seen right. a couple people hang a lampshade, and they're like in, you know, an ascot and a smoking jacket, and they have like the fez on, and they're sitting there with their calabash pipe, and they're like, Oh, hello. Oh, my gosh. I was kidding when I said that. I can't believe people really do that. That's awesome. Yeah, they, there are people who do, like, you know, they, they realize how absurd it is, and they just crank the absurdity up, and that's fine. But, like, no, just say, you know, start off simple. Hi, I'm Joe Schmo, and this is my comic, you know, and I'm going to show you some art now, and this is my comic, and this is what it's about, and the art is scrolling by, and da-da-da-da-da. For the love of God, don't just like hold it up to the webcam. I know you know there's a scanner somewhere at the library. Your friend's got one. It's down at the college. Use a scanner. Make the art look as good as possible. Right. Even if it's not done, you know, just make the art look as good as possible. Oh, and that's that's kind of another thing I'll get to later. Please have as much. Speaking as someone who started w with a project that had nothing done, you know, when the Kickstarter started, poor crap. Have as much as the project finish as is reasonable before you do your Kickstarter. Okay, it'll that, save you, you grief. That's you anticipated. You anticipated my next question because I want to talk about this. Like you know, um, getting basically setting it up to build in advance on a book, right? You if, don't have to have a pre-order model. I do pre-order models because the only time I don't do them, rather, is when it's simply not possible. Or, you know, but, or when it's just like, you know, the money is meant to finance the project creation. Mm -hmm. Like I do pre-order models now where the book is 99% finished by the time the Kickstarter rolls around for my own sanity. Okay. Because it's like, if it's almost out the door by the time the money shows up to print it, it's, it gets to people faster and the Kickstarter is out of my hair faster because the Kickstarter will drag on after that 30 <laughs> days, even if you do everything completely right. Yeah, yeah, I, that's what I've heard from multiple friends who have done Kickstarters is like uh, fulfilling reward tiers a year I'm later. I'm still fulfilling this, Smut Peddler. I'm, these are what the hardcovers, uh, uh -huh. they're still going out because we're still waiting on, you know, parts of the bonus packages for people. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, so 
okay, so th- this is one of the things that, you know, I, I've read a lot of conflicting opinions on. And some people uh, have asserted, and I wish I had a link. I tried looking it up last night. But some people have asserted that, no, it always must be a pre-order. Everything must be done. You should be doing it on spec and then try to get funding yep. just for the printing. But mm-hmm. you're saying it's okay to fund, because this is where it gets yeah. weird, is that, you know, it's like uh, you, in one of the, the pieces of advice you ask for here is, or that you mention here, is that uh, this is for a project. This yes. is not funding your life. This isn't like, hey, pay, help me pay my rent, help me make some car repairs. This is funding the project. But right. what happens? Let's say, let's say I, start, I, I figure uh, I want to do a graphic novel. It's going to take me 10 months to do. I can mm-hmm. reasonably get, and I've got 15 pages of, of, you know, example art to show everybody, and I've got a good pitch for it, just like I would for a publisher. Right. Uh, and I say, I need 20 grand to live on while I'm doing this book. First of all, my first question is, isn't that the same as asking them to fund my life? Second. Fund my life? This is actually an interesting little point of contention. Yeah. Uh, my friends and I consider Kickstarter a spectator sport. So <laughs> when we're on late at night on Skype and we're working, we call it work training. When we're sitting there drawing comics and talking on Skype, when we take a break, we go and look at Kickstarter and we're all like, oh, look, incognito fund my life project. But <laughs> what fund my life is, is just like a rent party or my cat got in a fight and now I have $7,000 in vet bills. Mm. And, you know, Kickstarter will straight up not allow those. What makes a Fund My Life project different from I want to make this graphic novel, it'll take a year, I need $20,000 to make it, is at the end of that year, there will be something to show for it, a graphic novel. Gotcha. Something to show for it is the, you know, the thing that defines your project as a project and not just rattling a cup because you need a few bucks right now. Right. For example, yeah. Keith Knight, um, he had a $40,000 Kickstarter because when he was a teenager, he was a Michael Jackson impersonator and he wants to make a graphic novel about it. And he says, it'll take about a year. I need $40,000 for that year. And lo and behold, he got $40,000 because he's Keith Knight. You know, <laughs> he has his track record. He has his fans. He has his street cred. Everyone knows Keith Knight's done, you know, K Chronicles over here and Nightlife over there and Think Over That Way. And, you know, you know what you're getting with Keith. Mm-hmm. And that's why he made goal when he asked for forty thousand dollars to live on. Okay, then question two. Um, I do my twenty thousand dollar goal, mm-hmm. and suddenly, I, lo and behold, uh, I f- I find out that I'm more beloved than I ever thought, and I've got <laughs> seventy five, a hundred thousand dollars pledged to make this book come true. What do I do with that money? Do I uh, say thanks so much? You just gave me an extra big advance, or do I, or am I honor bound to put it into making extra things for the book? That's up to you. Quite yeah. frank, I, I know there are people who kind of see a Kickstarter, and let's say the Kickstarter's for ten thousand dollars and it makes fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, people go, oh well, that forty thousand dollars is going straight into someone's pocket. No. Because now there's a lot more people in on that project, and those people will have to have their pledges fulfilled. So your initial order of you thought you were going to need 1,500 books. No, now you need 4,000 books. You know? yeah. That's going towards those costs. And it's also going towards storage costs and shipping costs. And now you have to do maybe you know, a little more work, like shipping 4,000 books instead of 1,000 books, like you thought you were going to. That's not just a thirty, you know, a $10,000 project with a $50,000 final day. That's not just a $40,000 paycheck for somebody. <laughs> Quite frankly, I'm not a huge fan of nickel and diming, you know, little incentives on every level, like a T-shirt for, you know, $30 and then a keychain for $20. I think that is kind of getting ready to give yourself a huge headache. I that was, is a nightmare like, in the making. Oh, you are so awesome. Because that was my next question was like, how many reward tiers are too many? Because, uh, uh, you know, I go to some, you know, I went to yours and it's like, it's pretty clear cut. You know, there's like a, a, you know, maybe what, seven or eight different tiers. And it's pretty clear on what the different things are. But man, you go to some other ones, like especially ones like the big, with the big movie stars do, uh, <laughs> which I also want to talk about in a second, is... Yeah. Uh, they got 75 tiers and like it's hard to tell the difference between all of them it's like this one you get to go to a special screening in london this one you get to go to a special screening in toronto and you get a t-shirt with this one but you get a coffee mug with this one it's like holy cow who's gonna fulfill all that stuff well movie stars they've got assistance for that but exactly you don't have and i know people who have run kickstarters that have been way overfunded and they had the nickel and dime 
uh, reward tiers for, you know, keychain, uh, this, that, the other. And at the end of the day, you know, f- f- designing the keychain, fulfilling the keychain, shipping the keychain, designing the T-shirt, fulfilling the T-shirt, sk- chip, sip, shipping the T-shirt. When their book is published and they send out everything and their little incentives are sent out, they get a net zero because yeah. <laughs> everything has gone towards all the fulfillments and stuff. And ultimately, that's not really what you're looking for. You're not looking for a net zero. Right. There's the famous Sullivan Slugger story that got passed mm-hmm. around quite a bit where, you know, it... it, it yeah, it, <laughs> which I'll link to in the show notes. People can read about it later. But uh, okay, yeah. now let's go back to the movie star talk just for a second, because I want to get because right I know you got opinions, and I can't wait to hear your opinion on this. Because <laughs> this is something where I went round and round with a few people on, and I'm like, wow, we we all really violently disagree on this on this position. Uh-huh. Um, what's his name? Zach Braff, Veronica Mars. Even- I'm aware of that stuff. Yeah. I have never seen Veronica Mars, and I had to be told who Zach Braff is, but that's just me. <laughs> I'm clueless. That's that's awesome. That's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of me. So, you know. But um, this is the deal. I think Kickstarter is kind of in this in-between phase right now where it can easily support things like comics, animation, the occasional video game but it cannot support huge, gigantic, million-dollar projects. However, I think that time will come where, you know, a $10 million movie might be posted to Kickstarter and might be funded. Not now. Maybe one day. Not now. But Spike, this ruins Kickstarter then. I, oh, God. You know, I hate people who say it ruins Kickstarter. (laughs) Because, you know what? When I funded this, this right here, Uh Warcraft, in 2009... For $13,000, I had people telling me I had no business being on Kickstarter because anybody who can make $13,000 on Kickstarter doesn't need Kickstarter. (laughs) So believe it or not, me and Zach Braff have something in common. People telling us, what are you doing on there? That's not for you. That's not for people who could find publishers. That's not for people who could find agents. No, it's for people like me, people who can never hope to make $13,000, whatever. (laughs) Kickstarter is for everybody. If you think you can make it, go for it. You know, uh-huh. if you think you can put on a project there and you can ask for five hundred thousand dollars, go make your paper and congratulations. Wish I was you. It's funny. I'm not a huge fan of putting rules on it like only these people are allowed on. People this successful, you know, must be this successful, you know, below this success level to enter. I'm not right. ready for that. Yeah, that yeah. that that is a weird kind of um discrimination that comes about Plus, with that kind of attitude. you yeah. have no idea what Zach Braff's situation is like. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Maybe he's got three ex-wives who all need alimony and four <laughs> kids that all need child support. Plus, he's only renting his giant beach, beach house in Malibu. You have right. no idea what's going on with him. Who owns the rights to this? You know, what movie studio is going to film this part? And just, I mean, just because he's a Hollywood guy doesn't mean he's got $5 million lying around to make his pet project. But he's what? taken money from you, Spike. By getting that $3 million he raised for his Kickstarter, He's that's money that you could have had. <laughs> Actually, that's, that's one of my favorite things because if you go on the Kickstarter blog, they have answered all these questions way more than I have, way better than I ever could because what they have is statistics. I just have opinions. But when people see Zach Braff on Kickstarter or Veronica Mars or whoever, whoever, they sign up to Kickstarter to donate. If you go through all the backers on all these giant million dollar Kickstarters, you're going to find a lot of people who signed up yesterday and this is their first pledge. Chances are it won't be their last. All right. these big names are just drawing people in. Um, I know that the Order of the Stick, the only million dollar comic Kickstarter to date, the Order of the Stick Kickstarter, uh, there's a lot of people who showed up, signed up just to just to pledge to it and then stuck around and they've been pledging to other comic kickstarters too so thanks order of the stick (laughs) thanks zach braff thanks veronica mars i am all for kickstarter getting bigger i am all for more people signing up and then sticking around cool well that answered that question uh I I want I want to get off of that that the controversy thing get back to the advice a little bit (laughs) okay uh tier names you know the the you in the smut peddler 
Kickstarter, you used, you know, different, and, and Chris Straub did this with the Brood Hollow one too, is like, uh, you used specifically like, oh, are you a, f here's the fussy tier. You're fussy yeah. if you did, here's the swinger tier. And then it's yeah. like, you did the maximum tier. You were a, a grade A pervert, you know, that, <laughs> yeah. playing to the audience and like giving them like a uh, kind of club uh, rankings, yeah. right? Do you think that that's something more people should be doing? I mean, did you find that to be effective is what I'm asking? Um, I think it was especially fun with the smut peddler one because people would talk about people would come up to me at cons and they'd be like I was a hussy. Like, <laughs> it's fun. I'm a hussy. You know, they like that. That was cute. And anything that can encourage people to kind of everybody pulling in the same direction. Like we're all pulling that giant brick up to the pyramid to build towards the goal, you know. If we can all just sort of feel like we're in the same club, go for it. Frankly, the only reason I didn't do it with Sleep of Reason is I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I should have done it with Sleep of Reason. And I'll tell you why you should do it, guys. If you're like me and you have multiple pledge levels that are the same amount, Sleep of Reason has a lot of $100 pledge levels. After the Kickstarter is over and you go in the back end and you look in the dashboard, if your description for that pledge level is very long and has a lot of copy pasted text at the beginning like mine did uh almost all my kickstarter levels for sleep of reason began with a pdf and a print copy of the sleep of reason plus like that part goes in a lot of them the you know the dialogue in the um kickstarter drop down menu you won't be able to see which 100 hundred dollar level it is it'll just say a hundred dollars plus the first five or ten pay ten um words of the backer level so oh, you, you uh, have to do a little sort of, you know, kind of clicking around and figuring it out when you're trying to organize, you know, people receiving their rewards. So I say name your stuff. Name it as name it as wackily as you want. And then because it, it'll it, help at the end of the day organizing everything and getting everybody their backer rewards. Yeah, it becomes a shorthand in yeah. in sussing everything out at the end. Yeah. Uh, Plus, girls, girls, and women really like calling themselves hussies. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of fun. I, I, you know, and it's it's that tribal thing. Like we we like to be in clubs. I mean, back in the we were before the show was recording, we were talking about the early days of the internet when we had to actually make HTML pages for our comics. I remember I had a PHP BB forum, and <laughs> I, and there was a thing in there that you used to be able to do where after X amount of posts, like if they reach a hundred posts, their mm -hmm. subtitle will change. Yep. And so I started coming up with like funny titles that happen, like because they would show like different dedication. Like so, you'd be like a Maven if you did this, and you'd be like a superstar if you did that kind of that kind of idea. And people eat that stuff like poi; they go crazy for it because like I've got the special designation. I'm in the special club, you know. I remember back in the old, 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 the long, long ago, the before time on the something awful <laughs> forums, there were backer, there were not backer, there were um, poster levels like that. And there were occasionally poster levels that you could only have for one post. So for like 193, you were a certain level. But once you hit 194, you were something else. <laughs> and there are people who would linger on 193 for days <laughs> just to be that, you know? <laughs> So yeah, I know exactly awesome. what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then, uh, on the topic of, of reward tiers, because we got we got to wrap pretty soon. We got book recommendations mm -hmm. coming up in a second here. Um, how do you calculate your reward tier cost? Because you mentioned earlier, like you hit the jackpot, you got a forty thousand dollar, you know, uh, mm -hmm. overhead on the uh, the Kickstarter campaign. But oh, good news! You got to you got to ship all these rewards now. You got sixteen thousand dollars in shipments coming up. Uh, yeah. How do you front end that? Spike, because you've done this a couple times now. I'm sure this is on your mind yeah. when you're calculating your reward tier. Um, honestly, these days, I don't start letting the rewards kick in, like the rewards where I have to ship you uh, an actual item. I keep those numbers extremely low, and I don't let them kick in until you're given like $175. And if I can help it, it's something that's already there. It's not a keychain or a t-shirt I have to go out and make. Like for uh, the smut peddlers, for example, that are going out right now, the hardcovers, they have the original minis. Like, because smut peddler wasn't originally a digest size mini from the early noughties. And um, those already existed. You know, Trisha Lynn, one of the editors, uh, the founder, the person who runs Saucy Goose Press, had a whole box of them in her, in her closet. And she was like, we can use these. And she just shipped them to me. And now I, I can do that. I don't have to run to Kinko's or anything. That's stuff that exists. It's here now. And that does a lot to relieve the stress of getting stuff made. Like the thing that's really lingering right now is I'm making like a uh, 
a messenger bag and I only have to make like five or six of those. Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. that's like the one thing I have to order out for. And uh, those cost about, you know, to get a messenger bag, though, you had to give five hundred dollars minimum. And, you know, that way I kept the number low. So <laughs> I don't, and, you know, the drama is, is, is as minimal as possible because getting stuff made always takes longer than you think it's going to take. Always. Yeah. Whatever you think your Kickstarter, your fulfillment date is going to be, add a month to that minimum. Wow. That's a good rule yeah. of thumb. Okay. That is, that is something I will take with me if, when I, if and when stuff I get around to doing mine. takes time. <laughs> and the thing about Kickstarter is that process... <laughs> Whatever the process of stuff being made is transparent. This nothing is different. Stuff has always taken time. Stuff has always been late. But now everyone has front row seats to your stuff being late. <laughs> and they get, you know, there's a peanut gallery for your stuff being late. Yeah. There's nothing new about stuff being late. Uh, one final question before we kick into book recommendations. Well, I'll give you the final word, but I, I have one question of my own. Right on. You put together these anthologies. Uh, Ryan Estrada, he did the um, uh, the whole story Kickstarter yeah. anthology. P you know, you're networking with all these artists. Get them. You know, uh, like I think if, in Ryan's case, he was paying them on the front end for the work and then like recouping it through the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Taxes, mm. taxes. You got to do taxes on this thing. When you're doing an anthology, we got to pay all these people for this stuff because your is... artists get paid. Your artists get paid in these anthologies. They do indeed. Um... Basically, make sure everyone fills out a W-2 if they're American or live in America. If they're, you know, and I know this from experience, if they're French or Canadian or Australian, it's up to their government to get those taxes, so don't <laughs> worry about that. I'm not sure about the minimum. I think it might be if you've made like $600 in that way, you need to report it, but less than 600 I could be wrong. Check with your local accountant. Yeah. But yeah, when you are accepted into one of my anthologies these days, you get a letter that goes, congratulations, you made it in. Fill out this W-2. <laughs> <laughs> because chances are very good you're going to make more than $600 off of me. And uh, at the end of the day, you, you gather all that stuff up. And this is why I have an accountant now. I give all that stuff to my accountant and he figures it out for me. Bless his heart. And uh, <laughs> yeah, taxes don't, don't mess around. The government will be very upset with you if there are all these people reporting income that, you know, kind of traces back to you, but you have neglected to mention that you did this. Plus, you know, it's you're employing freelancers and contractors. You can write that off. It's, you know, do it. Just make sure everything is on the up and up. Kickstarter in general, my accountant has informed me that, you know, the government isn't quite ready to figure out where to categorize Kickstarter money exactly. So just list it as sales. Ah, okay. Well, see, there's uh, there's more good advice to throw on the end of this thing. So, Spike, yeah. before we get, you know, like a minute to do any final thoughts, anything I, I neglected to cover that really is a burr under your saddle about Kickstarter or about people's uh, criticisms of Kickstarter or people who say, yeah, but I'm not famous, I shouldn't uh, do it yet, or any, any, um, what would you say to that youngster who says, like, is it for me? Oh, is youngster it, or oldster? Uh, youngster or oldster. Uh, do you have an audience? Do you engage with that audience? Are you aware of social media? Do you have a Tumblr and a Twitter? Do you talk to the people on Tumblr and Twitter? Most of my money comes from Tumblr and Twitter whenever I do a Kickstarter. Tens of thousands of dollars come from Tumblr and Twitter. Uh, have you produced anything that people are really on fire for? If you're making a webcomic, has anyone ever emailed you going, so when are you going to make a book? Because that's when you should make a book, when people start asking for a book and not a moment sooner. Uh, get your street cred maybe two, maybe three years online. Go to cons, hand out minis, publish a webcomic, accept that no one's going to give a crap about you for two or three <laughs> years minimum. And, you know, there's no guarantee they'll give a crap about you after two or three years. Be prolific. Be polite. Be engaging. Be good. And things will hopefully go in your favor. But like <laughs> everything in life, there are no guarantees. When you have enough comics for a book, that's when you should start thinking about a Kickstarter. That is like the safest way to do it. You can come out of nowhere, fresh out of school, fresh out of high school, art school, whatever, and throw a Kickstarter up there and hope it works. And maybe it will. Maybe the baby angels will smile upon you and your $10,000 Kickstarter to print a book by a cartoonist no one has ever heard of will come to fruition. Maybe it'll work. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think it's very likely, but maybe it will. Um, really, if I were talking to somebody who's like 20 today and is asking, I would say put out a web comic, get an audience, then make a Kickstarter. Okay. Well, I think it's a good place to end. And speaking of 20 somethings, mm -hmm. uh, we have somebody new to the show today. Uh, we, I, I'm usually joined at the end by a librarian. Today I'm, I'm joined by a PLA. Like a librarian Padawan, kind of. A librarian Padawan, and and uh, actually, you can't get too close to these mics, Rachel. Okay. So yes, yeah, so get in there, nice. You really get friends with it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, they've been washed. Uh, <laughs> Rachel, you know, I don't. <laughs> Matt informs us it's a lie. Uh, I don't have the had the foggy idea how to pronounce your last name after all these years. Uh, it's Moyer. It's Moyer. a really stupid way to pronounce it. I think the Scots in my uh, way back ancestry just wanted to be obstinate and make trouble for everyone. So Moyer, <laughs> yeah. Rachel Moyer, and we we've known each other for a long time, but this is the first time on the show, you're yeah. recently employed at the uh, Ann Arbor District Library. Uh, yeah. um, is your Twitter feed public or no? Uh, is it private? I have a public Twitter, which is just Rachel J Moyer. Okay, but uh, it doesn't get updated very often. Okay, and it's not Moyer, M-O-Y-E-R, like Bill Moyers. It's M-O-I-R, no. like how the Scots would do it, like yeah. a proper Scot. I guess. So, uh, But yeah, yeah, so you're a PLA at the Ann Arbor District Library. You've been getting more involved with the comics programming here, mm -hmm. and you're here to do book recommendation segment with us. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Yeah, uh, I'm filling in for Sharon because I think I read a few more web comics than she does, and I've got a couple web comics here to recommend that have had successful Kickstarter campaigns. So. Oh, sweet. So it ties into the theme. Cool. Yeah. All right, Brian. let's, let's hear it. <laughs> Let's hear about them. Okay, well, I need to apologize in advance for any names I butcher because some of these are a little difficult and I'm bad with even the easy ones. So um, the first one is Ava's Demon, which is avasdemon.com, and that's by Michelle Chikowski, I think, uh, is how you pronounce that. Maybe. Okay. But it's a really excellent um, webcomic. It is single panel uh, online, but um, it's about a girl and this demon that kind of... Um, haunts her. Uh, it's a sci-fi comic. It, uh, it's got some really beautiful colors. And in th the site itself, I think, uses some flash stuff. All the... Um, oh. Yeah, let's, let's get that the mic. Okay, yeah, not good enough friends well, yet. Well, we'll watch see. what happens, Rach. If, I go, if I'm talking like this and you hear me talking like, hey, it's in New Jersey, and all of a sudden I go over here. And yeah, see how I <laughs> tunnel effect. Okay, yeah, awesome. Yeah. So there's a really narrow cone where it picks you up, and okay, that's so I'm that it doesn't saying. pick up ambient noise. But yeah, it's really a fun comic. I I just really love the color palette and stuff, and it's... Say it. No, keep going. Okay. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about it. This, uh. But, no, it's definitely a fun thing to check out if you like kind of quirky sci-fi adventure stories. So, okay. That's a good one. So, you said there was Flash stuff in there? Yeah, like, each... Um, I think it's Flash. Each um, chapter ends with sort of a video. I'm not sure how they're going to incorporate that in the book for the Kickstarter, but uh, it's cool thing with like a small amount of animation and music and it's pretty rad okay cool i'm a fan <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, what other ones did you have do you have any other web comics that we should check out today i do i have two more um the second one is namesake and that's by um isabel uh melon 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 i can't do french i'm sorry and megan uh lady heaton and what's more important is that we get the url all right, right and that is namesakecomic.com all right and that one is real library friendly in that it has to do with um, lots of fictional worlds being real and there being these people called namesakes that have the names of the main characters of those fictional worlds that keep getting pulled into those fictional worlds to play out the story as the main uh. character. And it's about a girl I named, I believe it's Emma, who gets sucked into Wizard of Oz and doesn't work quite right because she's not a Dorothy and it's like... There's all these secret societies and things connected together. It's so it's one of those fantasy stories where there's rules. Yes, mm, there's yeah. rules, and the problem, main problem in the story is those rules are getting broken. Okay. So we don't know why, but it's causing a lot of havoc. Okay. Wow, cool. So that's at namesakecomic.com. Yes, and the last one I don't think really needs me to sell it because it is by Greg Rekra. So it's Lady Saber and the Pirates of the Inevitable Ether. And that's inevitableether.com, and I think we'll need to put a link out there because it's hard to spell. But A E T H E R. 
yes. Yes. So. Inevitable ether. A e t h e r. Okay. Yes, and that's um, swashbuckling lady pirates uh, in a steampunk world. So. Greg Ruck is doing webcomics. I did not know this. Yes. This is news to me. So see, they need to be pr- uh, plugged on the show. So that's cool. So what's 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 the, the, the key most awesome thing about this one? Oh, for me, it's just swashbuckling, swashbuckling lady pirates. Like the main character is a uh, woman named Lady Saber who is a very colorful character and the captain of a ship, uh, airship, and a pirate. So, so it features like... Uh, Strong females, and strong female in the sense that they just cut people up, chop their heads off? Yes, and I think she's also a character with some depth, too. So <laughs> okay. maybe in both <laughs> senses, not just the uh, oh, kicking butt sense. I like my I like my strong females to like just kick people's butts and then show me their butt. That's what I'm hoping for in a strong female character, too, Brainer, I mean, after all. Like, I'm a fan of Xena, so I can't really like talk <laughs> about that as a bad thing. But uh, no, Xena's cartoon, though. <laughs> Xena is total cartoon storytelling. I was a Xena fan when it was airing, and I, just can't, I can't believe I just said that thing about butts. Anyway... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's on record. I know, record. I know. I just blew my cred there. I, now I'm a dirty old man. Uh, so, but th- th- what? It, it's uh, the inevitable ether. Ineffable In- ether. Ineffable ether. Okay. Yeah. Just trip you up a little bit. <laughs> so fans of Delilah Dirk would probably dig this thing. Yes, I definitely would yeah, direct t- them that way. All right. Cool. Uh, awesome. So. Any other ones before we kick over to Spikes? Oh, gosh. There's an endless list, but we'll <laughs> we'll keep it there for now. Okay, because you'll be back to do more book recommendations for us. Uh, hope so. we'll, hopefully. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, 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 okay. Well, we'll keep our eye out for you. But uh, in the meantime, comics.adl.org. So you can stick around, Rach. We're not, we're not closing just yet. But, um, but then also, if people want to follow you on Twitter, you're at Rachel J. Rachel Mo- J. Moyer at Twitter.com. Um, and I think my name is... On the cast, so... Oh, okay. It's, uh, Figure out how to spell it from that. <laughs> Matt, Matt put it on the lower third, and we'll link to it in the show notes uh, at comicsagreat.com. So, Spike, I know you got some books you want to talk about. I have a couple, and uh, I decided to hold to a theme on account... Um, I just finished out... Well, not just, two weeks ago. I finished out a Kickstarter on a horror anthology. And I thought I would be remiss if I did not recommend the things that more or less inspired me to attempt a horror anthology in the first place. And that would be one of the first indie horror anthologies that I can, I can think of, which would be this. This is Taboo. Um, this is far and away out of print. This is, but, you know, you can probably find copies on eBay without too much trouble. What this is, it is a horror anthology. It is published by Spider Baby Graphics and Publications. Uh, the art I am at, the art on the inside page at the very least is a uh, got some Clive Barker going for it, which is part of the reason I harassed him for it says right here art copyright 1988 Clive Barker, which is part of the reason I harassed him for the sleep of reason in the first place. And there's some more Clive Barker art right oh, there. Wow. And um, he did the foreword too. And uh, what this was is. This was an anthology put out by uh, Stephen Bissett. And, well, he, you know, he, he kind of put it together and coordinated the first few issues at the very least. And then, you know, it was published by other people. But general idea, stuff that was not cool for publication in the mainstream at the time, late 80s. And if you go through issues of Taboo, this just being the first, you will find things like the... Seed, which eventually grew into Charles Burns's Black Hole. You will find the first serialized parts of From Hell, you know, which eventually became that Johnny Depp movie and a graphic novel in its own right. You will find stuff by Chester Brown, you know, there's things in here by, gosh, I don't know, <laughs> a lot of really great artists, a lot of really great short stories. It's an anthology, so there's a little bit of everything. There's sort of body horror, and there's also like, for example, there's what eventually would become Black Hole, the sexually transmitted disease that turns you into a monster. Uh, it was originally this short story called Contagious. Oh, wow. And it's, there's about maybe 10 of these out, I think. Plus, there's one called Taboo Especial. Especial, excuse me. <laughs> and uh, these are easy to track down, and they're definitely worth a grab if you like horror or you like 
you know, comics from the 80s that are a little offbeat, a little not quite ready for prime time in the sense that they're too extreme for what passed for acceptable comics in the day. And that is taboo. And obviously so this, is just th- this would be an opportunity to say at libraries, actually, mm-hmm. this is the kind of thing that you could find at your library or get a librarian or a PLA to track it down for you and get it added to the collection, right? Right. So, I mean, because uh, ADL has a pretty awesome collection of comics and some mm-hmm. rare, hard-to-find things. The, yeah. Another, another I part. have all the taboos, naturally. I got them all off eBay, and they're <laughs> they're worth it. Most people, they're not really what I would call, like, super, super highly collectible by the collectible market. So you can find copies for $10. You know, it's wow. it's not prohibitive at all. Not bad. Yeah. Um, the second one, I believe this is the uh, Dark Horse issue of... Junji Ito's The Museum of Terror. And this is uh, the Tomie stories. There's actually, yeah, okay, that's volume one. This is volume two, Museum of Terror, by Junji Ito, who is my absolute favorite mangaka who does horror. He's my favorite horror mangaka ever. And if you ask why, I, I would tell you to read Museum of Terror. Whoops, phone call. Hold on. <laughs> Let me just turn that down. Okay, anyway. Um, this is the story of a girl. The Tomie stories in general, I've, it's so freaky and great. I just, I'm going to ruin it for you a little bit. Um, it's a story of a girl. She's a high school girl. Uh, she is not particularly well liked by her classmates. She's very much a flirt. She is very provocative. So the girls don't like her because they see her as really, really strong competition. And uh, the boys don't like her because they feel this weird draw to her. Like they can't. They can't stop thinking about her, and they can't stop interacting with her, even though they know no good will come of it. And for Tomie's part, she's not a great person. She's very manipulative, and she uses her sexuality as a bludgeon. Mm. Uh, while the school is on a school field trip out in the mountains somewhere, she confronts one of the teachers, and she informs the teacher she is pregnant by him. Therefore, he will, this is not an option, this is a demand, he will leave his wife and marry her. Now, the teacher, of course, is like, this is, a, this is not possible. I'm not going to do this. A scuffle ensues. Tomie is pushed off of a cliff. Tomie dies. Now, the school teacher, because, again, she was not a well-liked person, convinces the class to help him hide Tomie's murder. And they do this, and they do it so that every single person is complicit in the crime and equally responsible by chopping her into 20 pieces <laughs> giving each piece to a student, and they each have to individually dispose of a piece of Tomie's body. That is only the start of this story. (laughs) Because each disposed of chunk of Tomie grows into an entirely new Tomie, who is even worse than the original. It's an awesome story. There are two volumes. I recommend you get them both. And uh, Museum of Terror is one of Junji Ito's I like it better than um, Enigma of Amagara Fault. I like it better than Uzumaki. I like it better than Gyo. It's one of my favorite works by him. Wow, cool. It's just so screwed up. Yeah. <laughs> you sold me. Yeah. Uh, no, that sounds that sounds really that sounds like a really really scary version of Dororo by Tezuka too. Like this whole disembodied uh, like uh, the tearing apart of somebody and then like the little bits of him uh, being uh, Involving spirits and so on, but uh, okay. Well, I'm gonna skip my book of recommendations because we're uh, we're out of time. Uh, this goes Sorry. by so fast. No, no, no. This this it's just there was too much good stuff and uh, something had to go. And I'll save my book recommendations for next time. So Spike, thank you so much for coming back. I'm always glad to be here. I like talking. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you being so you know full of viv and vigor and energy, even despite all the traveling that you've been doing. Uh, what's the most important thing people should go to related to what you're doing right now? Ironcircus.com is where you can get your hands on Porecraft. It's where you can get your hands on Smut Peddler. If you are interested in being in the next Smut Peddler, submissions will be opening in a couple of months. Bookmark Iron Circus and watch it every couple of weeks, and you will find out there when you can submit to Smut Peddler. I will also, in all likelihood, start taking unsolicited submissions for publication in 2014. So if you are the kind of person who is horrified by the prospect of being an independent publisher, and they're out there, (laughs) and you have something that fits the Iron Circus comics byline, which is strange and amazing off the beaten path, unusual, maybe a little weird for conventional publishers, maybe a little dangerous, send it my way, 
I love high concepts. I love out there. I love wacky. I love bizarre. And um, I will be more than happy to take a look at it in January of 2014. Very cool. Well, awesome. And then your iron underscore spike on on Twitter. Twitter. And I talk about feminism and I talk about comic books and I talk about Japanese food and I talk about the horrible things people say on DeviantArt and Tumblr and Twitter <laughs> and uh, 4chan and all kinds of stuff. Oh, and, that's uh, right. I, I owe you. I owe you. You introduced me to 4chan. I did not. I had never been there. And then Sorry. you posted a quote, a terrible quote that I was like, what is this? And then I clicked the link and it was this brony thing. And I, <laughs> this just gets worse and worse. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was that moment where a boy became a man. <laughs> I was like, I didn't know people thought about this kind of stuff, but they do. That's awful. Every once in a while, I get to find somebody, and it's like it's like this perfect golden moment where they go, um, what? What, what's a waifu? <laughs> and I just them with all the kinds of horrible crap. It's wonderful. Oh, so that's a, that's why you should follow Iron underscore Spike on the Twitter. So thanks again, Spike. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Rachel, for the book recommendations. No problem. Welcome to the show. And uh, are you on Tumblr? I am, but I'm not going to be handing that <laughs> 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 So that, that can just be a mystery for anyone who just bored with the summer game and want something a little more difficult they can find me I guess <laughs> there'll be a game code attached to that <laughs> at play.adl.org not really everybody yes. if there was it would just be Rachel's sadness so uh, <laughs> so thanks everybody for uh, watching live and downloading and listening this show will be archived at comicsgreat.com slash cag82 until next time we'll be back in two weeks uh, Wednesday at 12.30pm Eastern Time at uh, you know comicsagreat.tv until then I have been Jersey Droz of comicsagreat.com and Jersey on Twitter okay bye bye I was after this.